So I'd like to ask if anyone has a question they would like to ask of Professor Sachs. Yeah, there's a question down here. There's a microphone coming to you now, sir. Thank you, Chair. And uh, congratulations, uh, Professor Sachs, and thank you for your presentation. I'd just like to bring you back to the Millennium Development Goals, which were very clear, uh, easily understood, time-bound and measurable, yet some countries made no progress, a few countries made some progress, and I'd like to know your view now in hindsight, as an economist, how might we have done something different? And second question, if I might, uh, just your view on the value or potential value of ag biotech to the developing world, uh, agricultural biotechnology. Agro-biotech, yeah. Thank you. Th thanks uh, very much. The, the Millennium Development Goals were eight goals that focused on uh, extreme poverty, hunger, disease, and education. The bottom line of the MDGs is where we invested, we made big progress, but we did not invest uh, the way that uh, the rich countries had promised or that we should have. So in this uh, uh, approach that I'm advocating, you hear a lot about the responsibility of those who have to provide that extra bit of uh, resource uh, financing uh, and so forth. And that happened to an extent in the Millennium Development Goals in one area, and that was in public health. And that was uh, where the biggest increment of development finance came during the years 2000 to uh, 2009. Uh, the Global Fund was created, uh, PEPFAR, uh, which is the US program to fight AIDS, uh, special US uh, malaria initiative, uh, something called Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. Bill Gates came along and put in, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates put in roughly $3 billion a year of their own phenomenal wealth uh, and uh, made a huge contribution. So there was a significant scaling up. But a couple of things happened that are very uh, important to, uh, to know. One is that we did not follow through on a basic commitment. And that commitment is that the high-income countries should spend 0.7 of 1% of their national income on development aid. And most countries still don't do that. Only uh, about five or six per year of the roughly 24 donor countries live up to that standard. The United States is the biggest disgrace in this, unfortunately because the U.S. does not give 0.7 of 1%, but 0.17 of 1%. Maybe they heard wrong, uh, but um, the gap of 0.7 and roughly 0.2 is a half a percent of GDP, which in the United States case with a $18 trillion world economy is $90 billion of development assistance missing per year because the U.S. doesn't live up to its responsibility. And that's a shame and a huge mistake because it makes the world a lot more dangerous. Where does the U.S. spend its money? Uh, it spends it on the war, on war. Uh, this is a, a mistake of, fundamental mistake of U.S. foreign policy. We spend almost 5% of our national income on the military or on, we spend 5% on the military plus veterans benefits and 0.17% on development assistance. That's a tragic misallocation of resources that is a grave mistake from the point of view of, of uh, global security. So that's the first thing that happened is we didn't invest. Then the financial crisis came in 2000. I mean, basically, the Millennium Development Goals came, then 9-11 came. Then the United States uh, went off to 15 years of uh, crazy warfare uh, in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. You name, by the way, another dozen places where we do it, quote, secretly, although it's not a secret when the bombs are coming down on your own head. It's only a secret to the American people who don't read about it in the newspapers. 
but we have drone war warfare all over the place. This is just a huge blunder for the world. So 9-11 came, all this misallocation. We got some part of the way on uh, development aid for health, but on education, for example, almost nothing. Shocking. How can it be that our governments can't figure out to help fund education? What could they be thinking? But of course, that presumes that governments are thinking. Uh, and uh, that often is uh, absolutely not the case. Then came the financial crisis in 2008, and the mood to do anything for anybody else absolutely disappeared. And so aid at best leveled off rather than continuing to increase. So the MDG period is really divided in two between 2000 to 2009, 2009 to 2015. We lost the upswing of momentum after, after the 2008 financial crisis. But what do I learn from this? I learned uh, two things, one obvious and, and, one, uh, and one contested, but I think absolutely correct. The obvious one is that it's hard to get the world's attention on anything like this. And so I call it social consciousness, not social conscience, but just consciousness. Are we aware of these issues? Are we aware that there are even things called MDGs or SDGs? You know, you're competing with a lot of basketball games on TV. We're competing with Kim Kardashian. It's tough competition. And then the second is that when we invest in them, there is a world of skepticism that it's all going to be wasted and lost. And this is, by and large, deeply wrong. Because there are a lot of people and a lot of professionals who can help turn finance into saved lives, into malaria treatment, into AIDS treatment, into uh, classrooms with electricity and uh, internet connectivity. There are a lot of dedicated people around the world and in any country that can help to do that. So if we think about the design of these programs a bit, it's not to hand over an envelope of money. It's to think about how in a very corrupted world where there's corruption every place, you make systems that can actually resist the corruption. First, to get the money out of Washington. That's the first place uh, where the corruption is uh, overwhelming. But then to make sure that it actually reaches those in need. And that can be done. And I can tell you in every area that I fought for where the money came, AIDS, TB, malaria, and uh, other cases, it actually produced wonderful results. It wasn't the case that it went squandered. Malaria, which is not a simple disease to control because it spreads so easily, it has a force of infection, as it's called, that's very high, is down by about 70% in sub-Saharan Africa thanks to the Millennium Development Goals because it really works to intervene. So what is the bottom line for us for the SDGs? It is, again, I would say, attention. How can we understand that fighting this war in Syria is not the way to security? but rather devoting ourselves to achieving development goals is the right way. That's number one. How do we mobilize the financial resources? It's not a heavy lift, but it's bigger than zero because raising two or three trillion dollars a year, it requires a little bit of effort. And third, how do we mobilize the incredible expertise that we have in a world filled with technological know-how to make sure that this is used effectively because it is true that our government institutions are often broken. The expertise is, not often, is often not inside. So we have to create new ways of delivery, new ways to use information technology, uh, other services, social companies, and other kinds of initiatives to get this done. But nothing that happened in the MDG period discouraged me from the basic concept that we can do this.
Oh, there's a second question, but I'd like to just ask one more question. Was a question down here? Yeah. Um, my name is Cam Cam from the King's Hospital School, and I'd just like to know how you think it's the best way to implement the Sustainable Development Goals globally. Could you, uh, sorry, hold the mic a little closer and speak loud, because that's the, uh, being heard is the most important thing. Sorry. Um, I would like to know how you think is the best way to implement the Sustainable Development Goals locally and globally. Yeah, great. So, how, I'm sorry, the last? I didn't get the last bit. Locally and globally. Locally oh, locally and globally. Yes, perfect. So uh, let's talk about local first. What does uh, Ireland need to do? Well, Ireland, like every uh, high-income country, has a big climate change challenge, for example. And that is how to get out of fossil fuels, which provide 80 plus percent of the primary energy for Ireland and into renewable energy or other low carbon energy in a way that is uh, economical, effective, and not causing an economic crisis in between. That is a puzzle. It's not a simple puzzle, by the way. I'm only qualified to talk about it at all by virtue of the fact that, as I said earlier, I spend a lot of time asking people who really know. And then I repeat what they tell me, and I sound smart. But that's like a parrot. Uh, you know, uh, I'm told by energy engineers what's possible. And I listen, and I listen to a lot of them, and when the uh, overlap of uh, those uh, circles, uh, the, the points of intersection are large. I feel that there's a pretty strong consensus on the way forward. And without going into a lot of detail on energy, uh, we have a lot of alternatives, wind and solar power and hydroelectric power, nuclear power, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, geothermal energy that are all zero uh, or very low carbon uh, energy sources. And we have a lot of ways to shift from our burning of petroleum, for example, to uh, zero emission vehicles by uh, going to electric vehicles rather than internal combustion engine vehicles. OK, my point is the following. Put a bunch of very good engineers in the room and within an hour, they'll sketch out Ireland's options. Incidentally, if you read the Irish government's strategy, there's nothing there, or almost nothing there. Uh, you wouldn't know that it had anything to do with Ireland. It's pretty much a, just a plain, generic uh, discussion with no reference that there is an island and it has these properties and 4.7 million people live there and it has these resources. Nothing about Ireland is mentioned, uh, but it mentions the general uh, problem, but it's not really problem solving. Maybe the government politically doesn't feel ready for problem solving, or maybe the government doesn't know the difference of a plain generic document and real problem solving. But my point would be how to solve this problem locally is Understand the problem. Analyze it. Understand what I have called the production possibility frontier looks like. What are the choices here? By the way, how much wind power does Ireland economically possess? I don't know, but I bet in an hour I could know more than the government does, maybe, because I'd know who to ask, or at least I'd ask. And then when that's not enough, I would explore other options. The government talks a lot about biofuels. I'm not so convinced because the biosphere competes with food needs. It competes with ecosystem needs. So I'm not sure one way or another, but I would try to understand Ireland's real choices. And on that basis, you can fashion solutions. And you can bring in an economist here or there, not too early in the story. But at some point, the economists could say that solution can really be helped by 
putting a tax on carbon emissions, for example, just as one example of what a policy approach might be. Or that example can be helped by Dublin investing in charging stations for electric vehicles, so building infrastructure. Or Dublin could decide that it's going, that all its procurement of taxi fleets in the future have to be electric vehicles so that we jumpstart the integration of EVs into the economy. Thank you. Have it. I'll just to finish, okay. uh, just, just, sorry, just uh, one, one second. This is problem solving. And getting to the bottom line, solving the problems is really what needs to be done. It's not politics first. It's not a game. It's not a campaign pledge first. It's not he's going to do this or she's going to do that. It's problem solving first. If the problem solving is good, then a lot of people across the political landscape can say, oh, that makes sense. And then you know you're on to something. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure we could all engage all day, but having regard to your schedule, Professor Sachs, uh, I think we'll need to, to wrap up the session at, at this moment. Um, could I thank everyone who's here, who's come to enjoy this really splendid occasion here at UCD, and particularly thank, thank Jeffrey Sachs for making the occasion and speaking to so powerfully today. Thank you.